So again in Lab 7, we're going to start with some simulations. So open up the 1100 folder and go into the Lab 7 folder. And there's three collision simulations that you're going to look at. So you open up the first one, and you see two masses here. And initially, only one of them has a velocity. The other one is stationary. In your lab book, you should write down the mass and the initial velocity of both of these guys. It's actually already started in your lab manual. So you write down the mass and the velocity, and you calculate the momentum. So just one times the other. And you do that for both masses. Then you will run the simulation and let them collide, and you stop it. And then you're going to do this again after the simulation. So you write down the mass, will, which will not have changed, and the velocity, which will have for each of these two masses. So you write down their mass and their velocity, and you calculate the momentum after the collision for each of these two masses. Once you've finished that, then you can close this down, go on to the next collision. These two are headed in opposite directions, so the velocities actually point in opposite directions. But again, you write down the mass and the velocity before the collision for each of these, and then you'll run the simulation, let them collide, stop it, and again, write down the mass and the velocity after the collision. Now the only thing that's tricky about this one is, remember, velocity is a vector, it's got a direction. That means momentum also is a vector. You need to keep track of the minus signs in order to get your numbers to work out correctly. So once you've got your masses and velocities before the collision and after the collision, you calculate the momentums, and then you're ready to go on to the next case. So again, these ones are pointed towards each other, so you write down the mass and the velocity before the collision for each of them, run the simulation, and in this case they just stop. So fine, you write down the mass and the velocities after the collision, calculate the momentums before and after the collision, and then you move on to the next page. So they first of all ask you what pattern you recognize in your values, hopefully it's going to look like conservation of momentum. And in the next question, they ask you to write down a mathematical formula that, that describes everything that you've seen in these three cases. So before I tell you how to use the equipment in Lab 7, I just want to point out something that's true in the manual for Lab 7. So for the first time ever, when they tell you to summarize your data in a table, they don't actually give you the table. You're expected to draw it in yourself. And likewise, with the conclusion, they no longer give you that bullet list of things that you're supposed to answer. You're expected to know how to write a conclusion yourself from now on. So that's going to be true for the rest of the semester, is that you'll have to write the conclusion without the bullet list and create your own tables. The reason why it's important for you to realize that now is that this is also going to be true in the lab exam, which is next week. So just make sure that you are aware of how to write a conclusion, how to write a data table, that sort of stuff. There is an information video online for the lab exam to help you prepare for it. I do recommend that you watch that early so that if you have some questions, you can find your lab instructor ahead of time and ask them. Okay, so now I will tell you about how to do the experiment. So to begin with, you're going to need to weigh your two carts. So the cart one is the one that's closest to the sensor. So you weigh cart one, you weigh cart two, and then you need to weigh them together. So you'd stack them like this on the scale and weigh them as one big chunk. And the reason why we do this is that then we know what the uncertainty of the total mass is. It's just the uncertainty of the electronic balance. So the next point is that I know I'm always hassling you guys to level your track carefully, but this is again another experiment where if you don't level the track very carefully, you find that you have a really terrible time getting good agreement between your values. So do it as carefully as you can. It makes a big difference to this experiment too. What we're going to be studying is an inelastic collision. So these two cars have been equipped with Velcro, so they actually stick together. So an elastic collision is a bouncy collision, they bounce apart. An inelastic collision is a sticky one, they stick together like this. Now theoretically, in an elastic collision, a bouncy one, you expect both momentum and kinetic energy to be conserved. That is, the total kinetic energy before and after the collision is the same, and the total momentum before and after the collision is the same. In an inelastic collision, a sticky one, we only expect momentum to be conserved. Kinetic energy is not conserved. The reason why is if you think about two balls of putty, and you throw them together and they go splut and stick, some energy went into deforming the shape of those balls of putty. To a very minor extent, something similar is happening here with the Velcro hooks. The two carts crash together, they flex, and we lose a little bit of energy to that. 
They also lose a little bit of energy to the sound they make when they crunch together, but that can happen in a bouncy collision too. So the collision that we're going to be studying in this experiment is you'll have one cart about two-thirds of the way down the track and the other cart at the dead zone, the edge of the dead zone, and you're going to send this one down the track with some velocity. This one will remain stationary. They'll collide, stick together, and then continue the rest of the way down the track. And that's the motion that you want to capture on your screen. So just to demonstrate, you give this one a velocity, they stick together in the collision, and they continue on together. So the quantities you're going to be calculating in the end are going to be momentum and kinetic energy. And for both of those, because you've already got the masses involved, what you really need are the velocities of the single cart before the collision and the two carts together after the collision. So I'm going to show you on screen how you get the velocities before and after the collision using the program Velocity. Okay, this is what you're going to see on the screen when you do the collision experiment. So first of all, I just want to show you which program to use. Um, often we've been using acceleration. This week you want to go back and use the velocity program again. So that's the program we used in the very first lab. So open that guy up. That's the best one to use. You could also use the acceleration one, but this one gives you a bigger graph. So I'm going to have to actually do the uh, collision now. So you're going to see this in real time on the screen but you won't unfortunately be able to see what I'm doing with the carts. But it's the same thing as what you saw before. I send one cart down the track about a third of the way. It collides with the second cart, which is stationary, and then they stick together and continue on. So this is what that looks like in real time. All right, so this is the bounce back at the end of the track. We want to ignore everything here. So this kink here, this is our collision point. So we're going to need the velocity of the carts before and after. So this is the velocity of the one cart, and this is the velocity of both of them after they've stuck together. To get the best results, it really is best if you just highlight about three or four data points, not too many, right before or right after the collision. And the reason why is that there's a slight bit of friction here, and that can really screw up your results. So it's actually best, you'll get the best uh, agreement if you only highlight a very small amount of data right before and right after the collision. So we want the fit on this, so I've highlighted the data I'm interested in. I go fit, linear fit, move that somewhere sensible, and then I would print this out. So I'm going to want that. And then I do it again for just about three data points right after the collision, and print this out as well. So that gives me my velocity before for one cart and after for both carts stuck together. Uh, those are the quantities that I'm going to need. Uh, so I print out those graphs and include them, and I've already got the masses of the two carts, and then I can go on to calculate the momentum before the collision, the total momentum, its uncertainty, the momentum after the collision, and its uncertainty. And then I'll do a percent difference before and after for the momentums, and summarize everything in a table, write a conclusion, and then carry on, because the next part is to calculate the kinetic energy before the collision, its uncertainty, the kinetic energy after the collision and its uncertainty. And then again, we do a percent difference to compare the two, summarize, write a conclusion. The only thing that's tricky about that second one is remember this is an inelastic collision. We don't expect kinetic energy to be conserved. We know that we lose a little bit to deformation of the Velcro hooks and maybe a little bit to uh, sound or to friction. So just be careful about that one. Think carefully about what the theory predicts and what your results mean relative to the theory.